thanks. Thanks to Elaine and Vince for inviting me. I really appreciate the chance to talk to you guys. So as Elaine mentioned, I'll be talking to you about a new technology we've developed called DropSeq, which allows us to use next generation sequencing, and particularly uh, the Illumina platform for now, um, to profile large numbers of individual cells, uh, transcriptomes of large numbers of individual cells in the order of tens of thousands in a single experiment. So we got interested in this kind of technology because we wanted to understand the kinds of cells that are resident in the brain. <clears throat> We're interested in uh, major mental illnesses and trying to understand how these, these illnesses arise in complex tissues, particularly the brain. And what has really um, dumbfounded a lot of uh, generations of neuroscientists is the range of complexity of these cells. We've known since we've been able to look at them you know, uh, with various staining techniques that they have tremendous variations in shape and size. And um, there really is no definitive catalog of all the different kinds of cells that exist. And if you don't have a definitive catalog, it's very challenging to really understand how these tissues are functioning and operating across, uh, uh, and also uh, dysfunctioning across in disease states. Um, so one logical approach to, to doing this sort of thing would be to look at the transcriptome, the gene expression of individual cells, because gene expression is so closely tied to the function of the cell. Um, the way that we currently do RNA-seq generally involves grinding up a piece of tissue and processing all of the resident cells together to get an average expression. So, you know, someone might say, oh, schizophrenia brains have, you know, a slightly lower level of this gene. And they usually are taking out, you know, billions, millions of cells from a portion of the brain and getting, a, you know, an average sense of the, of the uh, transcription uh, of, the, of those uh, genes. But those genes are operating at the level of cells, not at the level of tissues. And so instead, what we wanted to do was to turn the brain into something more like a fruit salad, where individual cells would be preserved, and you could basically sample all of the individual RNA molecules um, uh, that were present in one cell versus all the other cells. So this has been an exciting uh, avenue of uh, biology and genomics for uh, several years now. And there have been some methods that have allowed us to do this. And so I've, I've put on a graph some of the uh, sort of capabilities of existing technologies. There's sort of the traditional sorting of cells into individual wells, which basically involves taking cells and doing fact sorting or sometimes even just manual pipetting them into individual uh, wells of a plate and then just amplifying them as you would any ordinary library. Um, you really can only get to 50 to 100 cells or something like that. Um, maybe several more if you automate with robotics. There's, an, there's another platform that um, makes this slightly easier and cheaper called the Fluidime C1 technology. They've now upgraded, they're now able to uh, process about 300, uh, 400 cells at once. Um, and this allows you to get, uh, you know, these methods allow you to get you know, pretty much whole transcriptome data. There's also some interesting technologies that have been developed on this side of the axis here where you can actually look at hundreds, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cells for several select markers. Um, but what we're interested in is in this kind of space. Could we find a technology that would allow us to look at tens of thousands of cells um, across the entire transcriptome? Because this would really allow us to see patterns that exist in complex tissues. And um, as I started to mention, um, these methods that we have already, the challenge to using them in very, very high throughput is how much time and cost it takes to use them. So if you wanted to do 500 cells with uh, the Fluid IMC1 platform, this is slightly antiquated, so I don't know if they've changed their prices in the last six months or so, um, but um, uh, it would cost about $11,000 and take you about four days. Um, and so if you wanted to get to 10,000 cells, that would quickly exhaust your budget. So when we started to think about what we wanted to do, uh, make in a, or have in a single cell analysis uh, technology, we came up with a wish list. And the first thing that we wanted um, related to what I just described is the ability to achieve extreme scales, to the level where you could continually sample rare cell types and understand their patterns of expression. We also wanted a system that would allow us to look at scale, the sort of sequencing flexibly, so that at times you may want to look very deeply at a small number of cells or very broadly at a large number. We wanted to be able to be flexible. We wouldn't want to burn all of our equipment and our reagents um, if we wanted to look at a small number of cells. We wanted to be able to profile cells of many different shapes and sizes, which is important because tissues themselves are composed of cells that have dramatic differences in their shapes and sizes. And we wanted something that was simple, fast, and easy to do because um, just like a lot of the other uh, technologies in NGS uh, uh, sequencing um, 
have made possible the ability to really like do these kinds of experiments in your own lab and not have to go to book a core facility and all these other kinds of things really um, accelerate with the kinds of things you can do with this sort of technology. So I'll tell you a little bit, uh, start telling you about the uh, development and validation of this technology. And then I'll also, because this is kind of a practical hands-on course, I wanted to give you a sense of uh, sort of what it would practically take to have this set up in your lab. So how do we overcome this question of scale? We got interested in using a technology called droplet microfluidics. Droplets are tiny aqueous compartments. They're separated from each other by an oil barrier. And using microfluidics, you can actually specifically tune the size of these droplets, anywhere from picoliters in range to nanoliters in range. And we had been using this technology in our lab to measure, um, the, uh, basically do qPCR, very, very high sensitivity. But um, we imagined, what if, instead of putting nucleic acids in there, what if we could put whole cells and process the RNA content of whole cells in individual droplets? Since droplets are very tiny, our reagent costs would go down dramatically, and we could process many of them in parallel. So the challenge to using droplets, as opposed to putting cells into wells of a plate, is that they don't come with addresses. So the moment you make a droplet, it's very hard to track it. It's hard to inject extra stuff into it. So if you wanted to do a library generation in a droplet, that's very, very challenging. Um, and it's also very, very hard to barcode them um, once you've made them. This is in contrast to a plate. If you know the you know, location of your sample in a plate, you can just keep coming back to it and adding and taking stuff away. And that allows you to have a lot more flexibility. So the challenge for us was really barcoding these droplets for use in Illumina sequencing. And so we imagined doing this with a bead. We thought about putting a barcoded primer on the surface of a bead, have an oligo-DT region on the end so it could capture polyadenylated RNAs. And in the context in which a bead and a cell happen to be in a droplet together, the bead, which would be accompanied by a lysis agent, a detergent, would lyse the cell, the RNA would be released, and then it would bind to the surface of this bead by um, hybridization to, uh, to the oligo-DT region of each individual primer. But again, this reaction is happening across thousands, if not millions, of individual droplets. And in order to make this uh, something that we could actually trace, you know, individual RNA transcripts, we needed a way of barcoding all of the primers on that bead. It would be different from all the other primers on every other bead in every other droplet. So the way we did this was with a modified form of phosphoramidite synthesis, basically standard oligonucleotide synthesis. We took the actual beads that we were going to be using in Dropsy and we performed synthesis steps on their surface. We added on our <coughs> first round of synthesis um, uh, AGCRT. We, pulled, we split them back out into four uh, you know, chambers and did these sort of four different um, steps of synthesis and then uh, pulled them back together. And then after a second round of synthesis, we um, pulled them back together. So after two rounds of this process, you have a total of 16 different barcodes in your pool. Well, that's not that many, but if you repeat this process 12 times, you end up with more than 16 million different sequences. So now, just to be, to be clear, there's you know, millions of these beads in your, in your suspension. Each bead is carrying a payload of hundreds of millions of copies of a barcoded primer that's the same for that bead, but different from every other bead. So it allows us to deliver these very large packets of primer to each individual droplet. So we're armed with this reagent. We decided to uh, you know, basically take it into droplets and see if we can make it work. So here's our system. We take a complex tissue, we dissociate it into single cells, and then we incorporate those cells into droplets alongside a bead. Um, when a bead and a cell happen to be in a droplet, that's where the action happens. The RNA is released, hybridizes to the bead surface. We then pull all the beads together and we do reverse transcription in bulk. And we generate what we call stamps, single cell transcriptomes attached to microparticles. And then we can basically just take as many of these beads as we want amplify them in a single reaction and do uh, you know, NGS sequencing on thousands or tens of thousands of individual transcriptomes. So this is what the microfluidic device looks like in action. So all we're doing in this system is we're um, bringing together cells and beads into these droplets. They're loaded at such a low concentration that almost every bead, I mean sorry, almost every droplet doesn't have a bead or a cell. And so that gives you single cell resolution for the beads um, that happen to be in a droplet, there's going to only be one statistically. And so um, this is a very slowed down movie, and you can see these droplets being formed. They're a nanoliter in size. They're moving so fast, these flows, that you actually can see the um, uh, refractive interface between the two. 
the cells, uh, the, uh, the lysis buffer here has some um, uh, uh, glycerol in it, which gives it a kind of uh, thicker uh, uh, quality. That's why you can kind of see the interface. There's no diffusion occurring at this point. So um, we had this system. We, we, we were excited to try it. But we wanted a way of actually validating that it works. We wanted to be able to measure how specific are these profiles? How single cell are they? And so what we chose to do was to perform our initial technology development um, experiments with a mixture of human and mouse cells. Because the human and mouse transcriptomes are sufficiently divergent that almost every individual 60 base pair read that you, you get is only going to rely into one or the other genome. So we take these two different uh, cell lines, they're 3T3 and hex cells, very simple cells, and we uh, trypsinize and pool them together into a one-to-one -one suspension. So if DropSeq fails to recapitulate single cell profiles, if we take individual cell barcodes that we sequence and we take all of the transcripts that we happen to sequence for that cell barcode, you'll end up with a mixture of human and mouse transcripts, right? That would basically be going back to traditional RNA-seq or a smoothie, you're just averaging all of the transcripts in your pool. But if we're successful, then the individual cell barcode should be highly organism specific um, because the only way that that could be possible is if we're sequencing single cells. So here's some uh, uh, progress that we made on this technology at the beginning. So it was one of the first runs we did, and you can see that um, most of the uh, cell barcodes, which are these individual blue dots, are in the middle of the graph, which means that they have a mixture of human and mouse transcripts. So this was a little disappointing, but you can actually see what was encouraging here is that there actually were a few on the edges, and this would never be predicted by chance. These are thousands of individual transcripts that happen to be in one, from one uh, you know, single cell organism and not the other. And so this got us excited. So we kept doing technology development. So here's a little drum roll, right? Um, where we ended up being able to um, sequence 160 cells. And we found that the vast majority of the individual cells we sequenced, the cell barcodes we sequenced, were organism specific. So that really got us a sense that um, we had the right buffer conditions and flow rate conditions. All the different aspects of the technology were really in place. So then we went back and we just tried to figure out how we could capture more transcripts because um, you know a few thousand transcripts is nice, um, but um, these cells are very large and we know that they have a hard, large amount of RNA content. And so we again optimized aspects of our buffer. This is the same data uh, on different axes. And now what we have today is the ability to sequence tens of thousands of individual transcripts from single cells um, and maintaining this very, very strict organism specificity um, so that we really feel confident that we're obtaining single cells. We also know a lot more about the technology because of these kinds of experiments. So first of all, one thing we know is that the cell library quality depends on the cell concentration you use. The higher the cell concentration that you put in, the more uh, cell doublets you get, and this is expected by chance because you're loading cells at a higher occupancy in droplets, so statistically you're more likely to have doublets, and this follows a Poisson uh, distribution, so that's very encouraging. We also were interested to find that of the cell barcodes that were organism specific, their specificity was also dependent on cell concentration. And we found that this was, um, this was specific to the cell, the cell suspension itself, that no matter how well you clean your cell suspension, you're always going to have a little bit of debris or junk in it that's going to uh, contaminate other libraries. And so this is an important point that we make just anybody who's thinking about single cell analysis, this is something that's going to come up because you always have, because you're using a single cell suspension, you're always going to have some contaminating RNA and understanding how that contaminating RNA can affect your libraries is something that's really important to consider. So we also wanted to know what fraction of the RNA uh, we were capturing in the transcriptome. As we uh, used two different methods for this. We looked at um, a set of uh, artificial spike-in RNAs called ERCC spike-ins. You may hear about this a little later when you're looking at um, RNA-seq analysis, but it's basically a way of calibrating. They're artificial RNAs that don't exist in nature. It's a way of calibrating um, your, your ability to measure uh, species in your RNA-seq uh, pool. And um, for us, we, using this, uh, this set of RNAs, we found about a 12% capture efficiency. And this was supported by doing uh, quantitative PCR on our individual um, uh, drop, uh, on the same RNA from the cells that we use for DROP-seq. So both of those uh, measurements agree with each other. So based on this information, particularly this cell loading information, we kind of come up with some basic metrics about how we can generate this data. So basically, there's a trade-off between the concentration of cells that you use and the um, quality and the number, the throughput of libraries you get. Because the higher the concentration, the more droplets have cells, the more number of 
uh, libraries you can prepare in a given hour. So we kind of say that if you want to be aggressive and get um, more libraries, you can uh, go into sort of high, uh, lower purity mode and generate about 25,000 in a day. And if you're very concerned about purity, which may be the case for certain kinds of experiments, you can get about 4,000 per day. Um, and um, this, these numbers are also uh, very much dependent on, uh, or you know, assuming that the microfluidics uh, itself remains static. And we've actually been able to develop and improve aspects of the microfluidics that I think we're also going to bump some of these numbers up. But this just gives you a sense of kind of where we are in terms of what we can do with this technology. So what's the cost in person with respect to the earlier slide you showed? Uh, yeah, so it's a hundredfold lower than uh, existing technologies. So it, it costs about six and a half cents per cell. And this number is pretty static depending on flu whether you do pure or aggressive because the cost is not really in the beans. The cost is actually in all of the proprietary enzymes and reagents we have to use to get it onto the amino sequencer, which I will discuss. Um, okay, so I wanted to just take you through our first major data set that we published. This was um, of the uh, mammalian retina. And we started with the retina for a few reasons. First of all, we were interested in CNS tissues. We were, wanted to characterize complexity in a, in a neural tissue. The retina is believed to have the same degree of molecular and cellular complexity as any other uh, brain tissue, so it seemed like a good uh, place to start. But the other major reason we wanted to start here is that um, decades of really careful research have given us an enormous, enormous number of markers for these individual cell populations. There are all these different classes of neurons and then subtypes of these neurons that people have found to have certain functionalities. They only respond to this kind of light or this kind of flash. So we have very, very good information about this. And that allowed us to kind of benchmark and validate our de novo clustering of our cells with the existing literature. So in this initial data set, we generated about 45,000 single cell profiles from uh, retina from 14-day-old um, mice. These are pretty much developed animals. And um, uh, we sequenced them at a low read depth, about 14,000 reads per cell. So the way our analysis starts is we take individual reads, and they're paired end reads. Hopefully this is it's a little bit fuzzy. I'm sorry if that's the case. Um, and uh, the, uh, the reads are paired in. So the first read has our cell barcode, which is 12 bases, followed by a unique molecular identifier, which allows us to count individual molecules. The other side is a 50 base pair read that we align to the genome. So we align these and we group them by their cell barcodes. And then we basically just uh, count, using the molecular identifier, the number of instances of uh, each individual gene. And that gives us a final matrix, a uh, n by n matrix of n cells that we sequence, and n rows of genes that we detect. And each one of the entries here is an integer for the number of individual transcripts that we identify from that gene in that cell. So we uh, basically did a clustering analysis that's based on principal components analysis. This was a a um, method called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding that was um, adapted for single cell analysis by Rahul Satija <coughs> at the New York Genome Center. So this algorithm is basically just grouping cells together based on their common PC scores. <coughs> so cells that are close to each other are close to each other kind of in an abstract gene expression space. So over time, <coughs> you see that um, these populations which are colored by their final uh, cluster identities will end up separating based on the way that this algorithm works. And the ultimate uh, map that we achieved was one shown here on the left, where we had 39 individual cell populations that we had identified. And we found these to be um, quite molecularly distinct. Um, they had uh, numerous gene expression differences. Um, any pair of them had numerous gene expression differences. And then what we could do is we could actually just build a tree of gene expression relationships amongst these 39 populations. <coughs> and um, the way that the tree works is basically just looking at Euclidean distances of gene expression. And so it's not a lineage, per se. But what we found by looking at known markers of all the individual cell classes in the retina is that all of these populations group together by their cell class. So it's very encouraging. Um, this is a class of interneurons called the amacrine cells. These are the retinal ganglion cells, which are another class of interneuron. These are horizontal cells. And then there's a whole bunch of different glial populations that you'd also expect to see in the retina. We were particularly interested in the amacrine cell populations that we identified, because there were a total of 21 of them. Uh, many of them had never been identified before. Um, in, uh, we couldn't find any evidence of them in the literature. So there were some that we 
basically all of the ones that had known markers we could identify. There have some fun names like starburst amacrit neurons. Um, we could find those. We could also find some that are excitatory in nature. But <clears throat> this whole class of cells, um, which had been previously described as GABAergic um, amacrit cells, um, had never really been subdivided before. We found a, a rich number of, um, of cell populations uh, uh, in, in that particular uh, class of amacrins. Each one of these populations had more or less a unique marker. There were some that didn't have an entirely unique one, but most of them had a pretty good one. Um, and this is just to show you the kind of power of this sort of data, that you can then go in <coughs> and identify um, you know, specific markers that allow you to stain the, 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 the tissue, which may be useful for a variety of different experiments. It also would be useful for uh, generating you know, transgenic uh, approaches to uh, further characterize and perturb individual cell populations. Another major thing about this technology that we really wanted to make sure was that it was not over or under sampling individual cell types. Uh, because, you know, we want to be able to say something about the representation of cell populations in a tissue. So, um, fortunately in the retina, there's already been, thanks very much, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Um, fortunately in the retina uh, field, there's been a very accurate quantification of cell classes using microscopy. Um, and so we were able to compare our data with the microscopy data. And we found they agreed pretty well. There was a slight under-representation of rod photoreceptors and over-representation of other cell populations. But it wasn't dramatic, and it meant that we weren't missing anything um, dramatic in our, in our data. So that was very encouraging. Uh, another major question we had was whether our data replicated. So um, we generated this data over the course of three experimental days. And, you know, uh, in the days of microarrays, for example, there was a lot of difficulty, still in some cases, a lot of difficulty in getting um, replicable, replicable data. There was a lot of, uh, you know, inter-operator, even inter-day variation, which meant that if you wanted to build a compendium of experiments, it was hard to sort of uh, co-cluster that data. And so we were happy to see that if we colored the individual uh, cells by the experiment from which they derived, we saw very nice mixing. There's actually one population that was derived from basically one experimental day, and it turns out that those were fibroblasts, and they're not actually resident in the retina. They're a contaminating uh, cell population that probably came along when um, the person who did the uh, dissociation, Allison Viala, she probably just didn't cut off all of the non-retinal tissue. So that was also nice that we could see those kinds of things, because those things will inevitably come up as you're dissecting regions of the brain, for example, that don't have very distinct anatomic boundaries. So finally, um, over the course of the last several months since our paper has been published, uh, various collaborators of ours in Connie Sepko and Josh Sainz's lab have actually been taking this data and utilizing it to do uh, functional analyses of these cell populations to better understand um, you know, their role, their, their anatomical integration into tissue. And um, uh, of the 40 markers that they've made either antibody or um, ISH experiments on, all of them have actually validated. Uh, the drop seek analysis. So we're very happy that we think that this is a really good way for one to um, identify candidate markers for uh, staining and, and analyzing uh, tissues. So I wanted to talk now about some practical information to kind of give you a better sense of the molecular biology involved in this experimental process and also um, to tell you sort of what it would be like to set up this sort of process in your own lab. So um, here are the major steps of drop seek. The first is preparing a single cell suspension. <coughs> um, and this process is kind of uh, common to all uh, single cell analysis protocols, but it's important to talk a little bit about this process and thinking about it a little bit more in general because it's one way in which this is, you know, this sort of analysis is unique um, in sort of RNA seq analyses in general. Then what we do is this in droplet hybridization where we lyse the cell and we um, hybridize the RNA to the surface of the bead. And then what we do is we uh, perform library preparation on all the pooled be beads together. We then sequence the resulting libraries, and then we perform a series of alignment and anal analysis steps to actually get some answers to the questions that we were asking. So the part of this pipeline that's kind of standardized, that doesn't, uh, is not biology specific, is the center three. So I'll focus most on those, but I'll touch on the, on the top and bottom there as well. So this first part is the preparation of the single cell suspension. So the most important thing to think about <coughs> is to consider the biology of what you're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, every, every tissue is different, has different sensitivities, cell types are different. Um, and so it's really important to have some assessments of the fragility of the tissue that you're putting in. 
Um, we use a staining of you know, cell viability um, to make sure that the membrane is intact, and we also obviously look at the nucleus as well to make sure that nothing looks kind of abnormal there as well. Um, and um, it may also be useful to do some initial you know, fax experiments just to make sure that your suspension has the relative proportions of cells that you expect. Um, and um, uh, there are some other questions that sort of come up routinely, which is, um, you know, what kind of media are, are necessary to process these cells in our, in our system? And the answer is basically anything that doesn't have serum in it, which means that our system is also relatively flexible. You don't have to put the cells into some sort of stressful um, uh, uh, buffer that may also alter their gene expression or their viability. Um, the major way in which we achieve, yeah, go ahead. So when you're initially dissociating though and using the enzymatic, yeah. it's enzymatic ingestion that you're using initially? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so is it a high percentage of the cells that actually survive that, uh, that process? No, it's not. Okay. Um, so uh, it, it definitely dramatically varies from tissue to tissue. So dissociating a spleen, for example, basically just means mashing it through a filter. Yeah. And you probably get almost every single cell you can get out because it's just a big bag of cells. But uh, brain, uh, you're very dependent on a few different things. And we've, it took us a long time to get good quality suspensions. And we were fortunate, a guy um, joined our lab uh, who has a lot of experience cutting brains and keeping brains healthy in, in, in vitro. So um, he, his expertise was really, really important, um, R.P. Saunders. Um, but um, yes, so it, it, we tend to recover, we actually haven't, we're going to do very, very careful analysis of this um, with transgenics, but we believe we get something between 10 and 20% of the cells out. So how, how long does that homogenization take? That's also, that's also dependent on the tissue. Um, so uh, the more, so for brain, for example, the more myelinated the tissue, the longer you have to digest. You may also have to adjust the cocktail of um, you know, enzymes that you use. So it, you know, every, uh, every time we explore a new brain region, we find new requirements. And yeah, so thank you back off of that. So you certainly, at every step along the way, you risk altering uh -huh. And I'm wondering, have you taken a look at some of your data, maybe not looking at all the individual bits of fruit, but looking at them in the whole smoothie and comparing what, what you're seeing to other methods um, of whole transcriptome profiling? Do you get similar results, or do all of these steps completely change biology? It's definitely the case that, this, that the, dis the dissociation process affects the viability of the cells. Um, and um, even if it doesn't affect the viability, it affects the transcriptional readout. Um, actually, I think one of the most shocking things to me has been how well the cells seem to hold up. So the fact that we don't see like surprising, you know, markers popping up for certain cells that don't end up validated. We've actually never seen that happen. Um, the other nice thing about working in the brain is that there's a, a resource called the Allen Brain Atlas, which allows you to actually look at the gene expression they've done in situ for almost every single gene. And um, the, you know, obviously in situ has a false positive and negative rate as well. Um, but we don't see a large number of you know, bizarre discrepancies. Usually if there's a discrepancy, it seems technical on either our end or the other end. It's important to remember that dissociation is probably going to affect all cells in the same way. So you're not going to see, not entirely, but um, many of the same pathways that would be activated in, in cells are probably going to be activated in all cells and certainly within um, a certain class of cell um, you know related classes are likely to also experience similar patterns of, of expression changes um, so yeah it's, it's important consideration and, and um, certainly i think uh, it's something that the overall single cell field uh, will will need to address as we move beyond some of these initial so it's really easy you know, in, as a first pass question, in a lot of ways, to find sort of broad cell types, right? Markers may be preserved. But if you start asking questions, you know, between day 30 and 31 of my like specific experimental behavioral protocol, how does the brain change? I think that's when you'll start to run into some of those questions. Yeah. Um, it's great you're all asking questions. Please keep asking them. Appreciate so, it. Do you know what it is about the serum that is not compatible with the process? And yeah. what impact does that have on using We don't know exactly what the problem is. We know it. We know the issue occurs at the, the step of hybridization of the RNA to the to the bead. 
when we, so what we do is we have to, which I'll show you, we break the droplets. The suspension has to be broken with another chemical. If there's serum in there, which we unfortunately discovered, um, you when you break the droplets, um, a large fluffy precipitate comes out. Something weird happens. I don't know exactly what it is, but you can replace uh, the serum with BSA. So for example, if you spin down your cells, that's what we generally do. If somebody, if, if somebody has cells that require serum, you usually spin them down and then we'll resuspend them in a medium that has BSA in it. And usually for the duration of droplet generation, which is about an hour, the cells generally survive well enough. But the serum that's just sort of naturally No, 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 no. It would have to be, it would have to be serum added, like fetal bovine serum, yeah, in your in your medium. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, one more time. Yeah. Yeah. You can fine tune the rate of droplet formation yeah. to try to ensure that each droplet is <coughs> zero or one. But I'm wondering, it just seems like that just by chance there are going to be some instances where you might have more than one cell mm -hmm. loaded into the So, are there statistical ways, or how do you account for those rare instances where you have more than a single cell? Yeah, so um, it, it's not entirely rare. It's a 2.5% chance based on the current loading that we use for all of our experiments. Um, it's important to remember a couple things. First of all, um, the chances of a single cell uh, being a doublet with another cell is dependent on the frequencies of those, both those cell populations in your tissue, right? So for the most part, um, you know, most cells are very easy to distinguish from each other. If a glia happens to, you know, be in the same a uh, droplet as a neuron, we will see that immediately because there are all these inappropriately expressed genes. Those cells will probably cluster out separately and we, when we do our analysis, we often will see a very small population, you know, 10 cells or something, that share, you know, oligodendrocyte and neuronal markers, and so we just discard those. Um, the, I think that sort of issue becomes much more complicated and ch challenging when you start to look at like, developmental time courses where you're looking for very subtle differences, those sorts of things. Um, but for these sorts of analyses, it, it generally isn't a problem. Yeah? So red is relatively well characterized. Why don't you start looking in tissues that are less well characterized for cells that <coughs> prefer for novel cell types or, or cell types that are yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't have the chance to talk about that today, but we're doing that. Uh, okay. So we have about now 300,000 cell profiles from the mammalian brain and from mouse brain uh, across five or six different regions. And, you know, there's a couple different things that allow us, there are a couple different things we're taking advantage of that would allow us to actually call cell populations. The first, the first thing is, even if a cell, a rare cell population is not um, annotated by somebody, they haven't identified some marker, Usually the overall cell class is identified. So for example, inhibitory neurons of the cortex are known to be extremely um, heterogeneous. We don't know all the cell types. We found new cell types. But they all have markers of being sort of one broad class of interneurons that derive from this you know, uh, embryonic tissue versus that embryonic tissue. So we're able to place them in some context that gives some sense to them. Um, the second thing that's really useful is the Allen Green Atlas, right? So if you know, if, if we find a unique marker, especially if we find a unique marker for a cell population, um, and it's new, then we can just go into the Allen Brain Atlas and say, oh look, it's very sparsely expressed in the cortex, and it looks to be, based on the size of the cells that are expressing it, looks roughly to be, you know, an interneuron or something, you know what I'm saying? So that helps as well. So I was specifically asking about, like, in terms of identifying the targets. <coughs> so if you've got, like, a lot of very common cell types and a couple of cell types that are very less common, yeah. But you haven't really don't have a good profile on them. I mean, how do you know what to project to that Oh, how do you know? I see. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> specifically with doublets. Well, um, then when you start to look for unique for unique markers and differentially expressed markers, those cell populations will just be a combination of two cell populations, right? And if that ever happens, they're discarded. There's no they would never add, you would never mm -hmm. continue with those cell populations and, and assert something about them. So uh, just to sort of uh, reinforce some of the questions that have been asked, um, a, a cell count is really key. Um, and it's easy to count cells that have been grown in on a plate. But if you uh, try to count cells that are you know, basically dissociated from tissue that has you know, axons and dendrites or other kinds of complex uh, structures, you end up with a lot of debris. And so this is an example of a, um, a phase contrast image of, I think, hippocampus. And 
we stain our cells so that we can easily identify um, which are the, uh, the cells with nuclei, I mean, which are the particles with nuclei. And this allows us to get definitive cell counts um, and uh, ignore certain things like this thing here, which is probably not a cell, but just some kind of blab or something else. Um, and that allows us to get single cell resolution, right? Because then we can dilute to the appropriate uh, concentration. So if you're going through and doing something like a new layer stain or like a tripan, what, what um, um, so sorry, kind of getting back to the previous point you made about, about like uh, the healthiness of the cell population you're looking at, making sure that like association and homology yeah. and damage them, could you like couple this with like propidium iodide or triban exclusion assay or something to try to sort out like a, a healthy cells to yeah. sort before you do your drop so you can... So that's basically what this stain is. Um, yeah. uh, it's a, it's, it's not uh, PI and you know DAP or DAP or anything. It's um, basically it's a acetyl. It's a cholinester esterase uh, sensitive uh, dye that um, if it uh, basically blue is alive and red is dead. Uh, so you, you, you use it for viability and just count. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and actually, we've we've started to just count everything that's bright because um, it turns out that uh, dead cells, you know. Uh, they don't have inter they, if they're not a huge percentage, I think for us it's 10 to 20 percent, doesn't really impact things very much. And we want to be on the lower concentration size as opposed to the higher. Uh, so how do we calculate the number of doublets in our system? So here's an example. If I have a cell suspension that has 100 cells per microliter, um, and the volume of our droplets is a nanoliter, um, when the cells and beads come together, the cells are going to be diluted by half because there's going to be basically half the flow will be contributed by the beads and half by the cells. Um, you can multiply those things together and you get a uh, number of cells per droplet. So we operate in the regime of about 5% uh, droplet loading. And by Poisson statistics, this gives us about a 97% uh, singlet rate and a 2.5% doublet rate. So this is a way that you would be able to kind of control these things in your own lab. Um, and then, relatedly, you can also estimate the throughput based on the concentration. So again, as I said, the more cells that you have in your system um, per droplet, the larger number of libraries that you can prepare in the system per hour. So I'm not suggesting that you can get libraries completed in an hour. I'm just saying that the process of droplet generation is completed, you know, 7,000 something in an hour in this context. So let's move on to describing a little bit more about the in-droplet hybridization process. So uh, there's a few relatively simple pieces of capital equipment that one would need. Um, there's an inverted microscope anyone will do, um, and a few syringe pumps that one would use for a variety of other kind of microinjection uh, protocols that people do in, in labs. Um, we also use a kind of sophisticated mixing system. That's because the beads that we use are very heavy. So it's important to keep them mixed so that when you're um, running over the course of an hour, they don't all, don't all settle and then you get kind of weird distributions of uh, bead concentration. Um, people have asked me whether a camera is necessary to watch the droplets, like make those movies, and the answer is actually you don't need them. In our lab, we don't have them, and for our uh, paper, we actually had to go to another uh, lab to get uh, pictures with, you know, movies made so that we have nice movies for presenting to you guys. But um, you can actually just count do all the metrics of droplet uh, generation, look at the droplet quality and the occupancy, just looking under a microscope with a uh, hemocytometer. So the major kind of key reagents are the beads and the microfluidic devices. These are the sort of the things that are not immediately accessible from, you know, the VWR catalog. And um, the barcoded beads were, fortunately, we've taught a company called ChemGenes how to make them. <coughs> but basically, again, it's just oligosynthesis on a bead support, but they have to take out, um, over the course of 12 cycles, they have to take the beads out, mix them, and then split them back out into four, um, you know, basically synthesis columns. So it's a kind of an annoyance, and you, know, you pay a little more for it than you would for an oligo. Um, but, um, but they're able to now deliver those if people want to order them. And uh, the microfluidic devices, we make our own in a microfluidic facility. There, most uh, universities have a microfluidic core facility um, uh, available. And we have a, um, uh, thanks to Oni Basu, our collaborator on this work, we have a uh, design of this device available online that you can um, uh, take and then uh, use yourself to make your own devices, um, which is much, much cheaper than buying them, although there are companies now that we've given the CAD file to so that they can actually make these and you could order them yourself. Um, if you make your own devices, this is just, again, sort of giving you a sense of what it's like to work with droplets. You want to 
have a sense of what the sizes are of your droplets are, even though the design of the CAD file of the, 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 of, that you use will restrict the range of droplet sizes, it's not going to completely restrict it to you know, one nanometer. It could vary you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 percent. So you can use basically just fluorescent beads, load them at a known concentration, and then count their occupancy um, in this resulting uh, droplet suspension, and that gives you a sense of the overall concentration. Um, the overall occupancy will give you a sense of the size of the droplets. Um, so, uh, so basically, I've mentioned already kind of what you need to do to generate to make prepare your cells, and then in order to prepare your beads, you basically just wash them a couple times and you um, suspend them at a, a reasonable concentration that doesn't involve clogging the chip, because the higher you go, the more likely you are to clog the chip. Um, and this gives you um, uh, the two you know, suspensions that you'll need to actually perform drop seek. And then what we do is we flow these suspensions in at the uh, flow rates described. Um, and the flow rates may depend, change depending on um, you know, exactly uh, how um, uh, larger droplets are and other aspects of the, of the technology, but this is what we use for the paper. So um, you have your droplets, and this is what they look like. It's kind of a creamy suspension that's on the top of an oil layer, because <coughs> um, the oil is quite dense, so the, the droplets, which are aqueous, rise to the top. And then what you do is you add a, um, a reagent called PFO, which um, binds all the surfactant in the oil and basically separates them into oil and water. Um, and we also uh, largely dilute our system with our, um, our droplets with uh, SSC so that when the uh, droplets are lysed, all the RNA is released into a very large um, uh, aqueous volume. So anything that hasn't been bound will kinetically be very unlikely to find another bead after droplet breakage occurs. Because of course this is the you know, big concern. We don't want any um, hybridization to inappropriately occur after we break droplets. So, um, Basically, the, uh, the, uh, we, you know, we uh, collect all the beads from this aqueous com compartment um, and uh, basically just suck this all off from uh, the tube and then all of this oil and debris and stuff just um, hangs out at the bottom. So if you had serum here, uh, this, this sort of flaky stuff, which is probably like cell debris and stuff that precipitates, would actually be you know, six times or ten times as large. So a few questions I often get is whether you can reuse devices, and the answer is we don't really know because we don't bother, but um, uh, we, have some we have some concerns about doing that. Um, uh, people often ask about bead doublets too, you know, there's cell doublets and bead doublets. Bead doublets are um, potentially concerning for certain kinds of uh, experimental questions um, where you're basically partitioning the RNA into two individual beads. For the most part, we don't uh, identify them in our subsequent analysis because by partitioning them, you're basically reducing the amount of RNA content by half, and so if you're restricting to a certain size in the library, a lot of those get discarded anyway. In our system, about 5% of the um, occupied droplets have two uh, or more beads. <clears throat> and then the other question that often comes up is worrying about RNAs in this system, right? Because you're lysing and then hybridizing. Um, and uh, should one be concerned about different uh, levels of RNAs contamination? I think that the main answer uh, to this is that um, uh, because droplets are so small, any exogenous RNAs from you like spitting or whatever, because uh, everybody of course spits all over their samples, um, uh, wouldn't really matter because uh, your partitioning is such a small compartment that the chances of an RNAs molecule happening to get in there are very low. But what is more of a concern uh, potentially is endogenous RNAs. Is every cell has RNAs in it. We, we're fortunate to be working on the brain. I'm sorry that uh, this, some of these slides didn't come out so well. It's not you, it's the projector. Okay, all right. Um, so brain is down here. Uh, so it's the, it has the least RNA, RNA activity of any major mammalian tissue. So for example, uh, somebody recently emailed me that they want to work on the pancreas. Just say and no. I, what? Just say no. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I, you know, I think that it may require you know, this new technology. Somebody's going to have to figure out additional additives to maybe control that RNA activity. Because I have a feeling that that will dramatically reduce the quality of your libraries. Um, we've also had some concerns uh, uh, that beads may sometimes break because they're a little bit fragile. But um, uh, I'll just say that that isn't a problem uh, with our system so far. Um, we're able to uh, eliminate these. Uh, these bead fragments later on in the process of, of generating these libraries. So um, uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit now about library preparation, just so you get a sense of the molecular biology. So 
Here is the, uh, here's the bead and the structure of the primer on the bead. You have your T-sequence, the molecular barcode or a unique molecular identifier for counting transcripts, your cell barcode, and then this SMART sequence, <coughs> which is basically a proprietary sequence. SMART PCR is a way of amplifying um, RNA from a, um, from a pool, and we just use the same sequence that's used for their primers. It's a clone tech um, product. <coughs> so RNA hybridizes in the droplet to the, uh, the uh, oligo-DT region. And then our, our, our reverse transcriptase, once you've gathered all the beads and started the reaction, will then extend your RNA to the end. And now we do this really tricky thing called template switch amplification, which is really crazy. Um, basically, uh, the RT adds three Cs on the end of a elongating cDNA. And then another primer that you put into to solution has three Gs on the end that happen to hybridize these three Cs. And the reverse transcriptase senses this hybridization and um, will just continue elongating this transcript as if it's all one contiguous template. So you um, end up getting a full product that has a handle on either side of your cDNA. Um, we slightly modify uh, the, 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 basically th these two sequences are almost the same, but they're slightly modified. Um, so this, pretty, you know, this is a, a system that's been used in a lot of other single cell analysis. Fluidine uses a very similar technology. But in terms of molecular biology, I think it's worth pointing out, it's, it's pretty crazy um, that it works. So you guys changed the sequence? We were talking about this yesterday where we have the same sequence and that comes from the airplane and minimize the amplification of the smaller product. Okay, so you did talk about this, yeah. great. Um, so we uh, only modify two bases at the end. The only reason to modify it is that we only want to sequence this three prime end, which I'll describe. <coughs> if you have the same exact sequence on either side, you don't have a unique handle to grab onto the three prime end versus the five prime end when you make your final library. But it is sufficiently similar that it will form the same hairpin and enrich for long fragments. Cool, I'm glad that that was described. Um, so um, uh, then we do this exonuclease treatment because we have hundreds of millions of primers delivered and if we're only capturing thousands of transcripts, most of our primers are actually not used. So we digest some of them away, at least. We know we don't digest all of them away. We digest some of them away with exonuclease 1, which is specific for single-stranded uh, primers. And then uh, what we do is we take these kind of processed beads and we apportion them into PCR tubes. And what we do right now is we basically um, put 2,000 beads at our 0.05 occupancy, that means about 100 cells, in into an individual well. And then we do parallel amplification of those. So if we do 10,000, it's basically a 96 well plate. The reason that we uh, subdivide in this way is that if we have too many beads in a reaction, we notice that the residual primers um, basically start making mischief and you get primer dimers. So we, um, we tend to just go to 2,000, although um, I know, I've heard that other people have been starting to use more, which obviously would economize to some extent the, uh, the cost of this. So this is what our cDNA looks like after our amplification step. This is a typical reaction, 13 cycles of PCR from 100 cells using the, the, the cells that we use in our paper. So it's about you know, 15, 13 to 1500 bases in size, um, and you've eliminated all of this stuff using a combination of uh, bead uh, selection, uh, you know, the spry bead selection, and also the, um, the template switch uh, uh, process suppresses um, small fragments. So um, I want a couple considerations. The yield is strongly affected by the cell type. Um, we observed this immediately when we went to the retina. The, the average size of a retinal cell is very low because rod photoreceptors, which are 80% of the tissue, um, are actually one micron in size, really, really small. So um, you may need more cycles of amplification for tissues that have smaller numbers of cells. Um, we generally don't go over 16 cycles because we start to see weird things happening. Um, so once we have this cDNA that's amplified, we now need to actually grab individual small fragments for Illumina sequencing. So the unfortunate reality of being in a small read uh, world, I wish we had long reads, um, uh, because it would dramatically reduce the uh, cost, particularly because Nextera is so expensive, um, required to generate these libraries. So what you do is you basically perform Nextera. Have we talked about Nextera? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is selective in the sense we use our own primers. Are you guys doing full reactions or are you doing diluted reactions the Nextera? Uh, we use full reactions. But of course, it's only, it's only uh, one reaction per 10,000 because we pool everything together. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still costly. It's like 70 bucks. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
So, um, so yes, yeah, so we, use, we use a full reaction, but we use our own primers. And the reason for that is that when you chop up your cDNA, you're going to end up with these, uh, what is it, seven different fragments um, that will have all of these different um, you know, adapter qualities. So in standard <coughs> Illumina uh, uh, tagmentation, you're basically going to only enrich these fragments. That's what you would enrich. But those are all, in the, those are for us, those are the center of the cDNA. They don't have our barcode. So what we want is to generate um, libraries from this, this end of the cDNA where um, we have our cell barcode and molecular barcode. So basically, we just use uh, specific primers that only enrich for this specific region, and we add the P5 sequence on using that, that, uh, that special primer. So this is what our uh, next era libraries look like in the end. We tend to try to get uh, 500 to 600 base pairs in size because we're sequencing um, polyadenylated fragments. So a large, um, unfortunately, we have to discard a fair number of our reads because if they're too small, we're end, end up just sequencing poly A. So we have to get far enough out with that second read that we actually read into meaningful uh, cDNA sequence and not just poly A. So that means that um, we try to aim for on the larger side of individual fragment sizes. <coughs> so finally, sequencing. I mentioned much of this already. Um, we sequence uh, 12 bases, so 20 bases for read one. And 12, first 12 are the cell barcode and the UMI are the, uh, the, the last eight. And then the second read, which is 50 or 60 base pairs, is our cDNA read. This is sort of the structure of what an individual uh, read would look like. Uh, we've only tried this on MySeq and NextSeq, although recently some folks have said that it also works on the HiSeq. We use our own custom primer, so it was some questions about whether the primer system would work with HiSeq, all this kind of stuff. Of course, nobody wants to screw up a HiSeq run, so it's harder sort of to get somebody to grit and bear potentially ruining their high seek run, but I think somebody said recently that they got decent data from it. Um, another question we often get asked is what, what read depth per cell, um, and traditionally in single cell analysis, hundred uh, million reads have been used per cell. We're at a much lower level, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 reads per cell. Um, and the reason for that is that the, percent, the proportion of information that you get from sequencing deeper is much lower than what you would get from just sequencing more cells. And since we always have more cells available to us, generally, might as well just sequence more cells. And of course, that doesn't apply to the point where you're sequencing 100 million cells, because then you're only getting a few reads per cell. But in the range of 10,000 to 100,000 reads per cell, that's kind of where we find things to be relatively optimal. Um, but for certain questions, you may require more read depth. So I don't have too much time, and it's kind of a huge bear in of itself. But then it's like, what do you do with this data, right? Um, it's pretty complicated to um, actually analyze it and read it. But we have um, we have this sort of overall flow uh, of the way that we process the data. We align and tag reads, um, and we generate a digital gene expression matrix that I described. And then we use a system to identify the number of stamps, basically. Um, I'll just mention this, actually, this one step uh, before I stop. Um, so uh, most beads will never have contacted a cell. Um, and so you have to identify which beads are the empty beads and which beads are the occupied beads, the ones that had a cell. So if you order the beads um, by their size, the cell barcodes by their size, and you do a cumulative distribution of the fraction of reads that are portioned to those individual cell, uh, cell barcodes, you see there's an inflection point. And that inflection point corresponds to the number of cells that you put in. It always is very close, you know, approximately close to the estimated number of cells you put in your sequencing library. So that's how you find your number of cells. <clears throat> I think I'll stop there because I want to make sure there's time for questions. Um, but if you do have any other questions about analysis, you can feel free to let me know. And I'll just mention that the, uh, the big picture in terms of the cost is about six and a half cents per cell, $650 for 10,000 cells. And most of that cost, as I said, is in kind of proprietary reagents. And I'll just thank the folks who've been involved. Melissa and Jim, Jim Nemish in our lab have been really essential to uh, kind of doing this open source process that we're trying to adopt for this technology. So we have a website that has all this information and a huge, you know, very detailed protocol, dropseek.org, and I invite you to check it out and think about whether this might be something that's useful to your own biological applications. ODT is pretty selective. Mm -hmm. um, so we get like maybe 10, 20% of our reads going to ribosomal RNA at worst. Okay. So it generally doesn't impact things too much. And my second question, which may be, seem crazy, but can you do, could, you, could you do this with DNA as well? 
Um, we're exploring that. DNA is harder because you have to get into the nucleus. Um, and furthermore, there's no easy handle for grabbing on to DNA, right? You can't just put 30 Ts on the end of your primer and expect to capture chromosomes. Have you tried uh, partitioning nuclei instead? <coughs> uh, we have partitioned nuclei, um, mostly because you know frozen brain tissue is a nice resource, postmortem resource. So we've tried to take postmortem brain tissue that's been frozen, isolate nuclei, and generate libraries. And we can generate libraries, but they're pretty poor, just because the, uh, the polyidentified RNA content, I think, in, in uh, nuclei is pretty low. Did you say it's about 12% of the art mystery and it's captured for sale? Yeah. Is that basically a limitation of reading or Yeah, so um, we published this. It, uh, it's, a, it's a supplemental figure. It's, it's a little mysterious. So um, it's not a bead occupancy issue. So if you add um, progressively, so if you add five-fold more RNA to your beads, you capture five-fold more RNA. So the beads are capable of capturing more, but for some reason, They've just decided that, you know, something like 15% is all that they're going to hybridize to. There's a lot of possibilities for why that might be. There could be secondary structure issues or other issues that are impacting the ability of the individual transcripts to hybridize. But we haven't figured out exactly how to sort of get beyond that 15% number. Yeah. So if you had a very cell type, let's say it was 1% of the total cells, that you more interested in than the rest of the 9%, is it? Is it feasible to like enrich your sample through bus and or yeah. for, for a vaccine? Okay. Yeah, we've we've done that. Um, so <clears throat> with the retina, um, the two major populations that we kind of didn't get a lot of uh, as much heterogeneity as we wanted were the retinal ganglion cells and bipolar cells. And we've sorted the bipolar cells, and we have a huge number of profiles, and they look quite healthy. Some cells don't survive facts very well, and that's a big issue. So it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. So I would actually argue that this might be an excellent system in which to assess the development of a tissue that is comprised of multiple different lineages. You know, if your resolution was sufficient, you, know, you could harvest samples every 24 to every 12 hours, you could actually build a PCA plot that showed how certain precursor populations would evolve to their um, final end of the line um, fully differentiated structure. So I think that would be one way of getting around the issue that I went before about having um, you know, maybe a cell has begun its process of differentiation but hasn't completely arrived. So if you take one single snapshot, it's going to appear in between two cell populations. But I think that there's a lot of possibilities here. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm an intestine person, so I'm not going to volunteer any specimens because my RNA's level is off of your chart, even higher than the pancreas. But um, I think that the great presentation, a lot of possibilities here. Yeah. The well. Yeah, I think it's great idea. Uh, so I think you said two questions, one for the more practical, so for the um, well-funded but lazy, how much longer does this take compared to the same one drug? The well-funded but lazy. Um, I guess it depends on how lazy you are. <laughs> okay. um, you know, and in and, and what ways in which you're lazy. Um, I mean, uh, when you're up and running, you're generating 100-fold more data at 100-fold less the cost than Fluidine. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, but um, you have to get it up and running. We've talked to people, it takes them, I mean, so one, I have a good example I like to keep in my head because it's somebody who just started a new lab, doesn't have, she's a, a geneticist, she has no expertise in microfluidics, and she got it up and running in her lab in three months. So I don't think it's a huge activation energy. And it saves you a lot, I mean, you think about a lot of these, I, I, when I, before I got this working, I was trying to do single cell stuff sort of the old fashioned way, and, um, there's a lot of wasted time there. You know, you got to book your fax facility. You got to, you know, if you're doing fluidine, you know, unless you're really rich, you don't have your own C1 system. So then you got to like reserve that, and you know, there's a lot of like hidden annoyances there. And the other thing that I think is really important to keep in mind is that you know, cell, cells die quickly. They they're sensitive, and if you're having to sort of time things so that you know your suspension is ready at you know the 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. slot that you have the core facility book, that's a big pain. I hate it. So I, I think all those things kind of add up to, but you know, it, it, you know, the, it's not out of the box, right? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a commercial guy, so I'm not, I'm not going to sell kit, but we try to make it as easy as possible. And then I think that's more on the percentage. So I'd be kind of interested with the 
I do think, you know, I do think there is some, obviously going to be some loss, right? And we know, as you, as you say, that, that processes of all sorts, brain and otherwise, carry a lot of interesting RNAs in them. But of course, they're made of the nucleus. So there's right. going to be some turnover. And, um, you know, we see things that are, you know, transported to the axons, for example, um, whether, and dendrites, whether or not we see everything in all sorts of dynamic changes, I think that we definitely don't. Yes? So what's the, in terms of getting this up in a lab that doesn't do it, what do you think is the cost ballpark? The capital equipment is about, if you have an inverted microscope, which is one of the major, yeah. uh, it's about 8000 Five to eight thousand dollars. It's uh, three syringe pumps. All of them are about twelve hundred bucks. And then um, you know you got to buy the beads. Well, that's sort of more of a consumable. Um, and, um, and you know a few other things here and there. But um, and then of course it also depends on if you make your own devices. If you make your own devices, they're like pennies to, to make. But um, if you buy them, it's about um, you know it's several hundred dollars to buy one of these chips that has multiple um, copies of the of the device on them. So. You know, it kind of depends on your degree of laziness, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there any way that kind of inhibit transcriptional changes while they're in the drops? Or are you writing <coughs> any kind of drug to inhibit transcription so that during the process or while they're waiting to be lysed, they're not changing expression at all? That's a great idea. Um, we've taken the approach which you know, sort of early stages of trying to do this with fixed tissue. So I think that that's a possibility. If you fix everything, then um, it may be, you can kind of take your time. Um, but uh, it is an interesting idea to think about using like a transcription inhibitor. But of course, you also have to worry about degradation, you know. Um, so maybe there'd be ways of fixing that too, RNA inhibitors, I don't know. But it'd be interesting to see if you compare the two samples, like if there is a significant shift in the populations that do survive the homogenization and sorting yeah. or the microfluidic separation. Um, yeah, because that's always my concern. Because like, this isn't really very quantitative at this point, right? It's more qualitative of populations. You couldn't necessarily compare um, different cells within uh, some kind of homogenet or I mean, it, it depends on what you're trying to ask, you know? I mean, most of, so, so there's two major reasons why you might not get a biological answer. One is, as you say, that, you know, there are biological signals obscured by dissociation or other artifacts related to what happens to the cells. And then the other thing is that you may not capture enough transcripts to actually get your answer, because 12% is the upper bound. And if you're sequencing, you know, it may, may not, you may very well may not get to 12%. Um, so I think those are the two considerations you have to have in mind. Um, but I think, I think there's a huge amount of biological, uh, you know, there's a very fertile area for which, uh, which this can actually address. Whether or not I can address every single potential question, I think it probably can't. But um, we'll uh, keep working on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, why don't you go ahead? Um, has your lab considered the use of this technology for like a uh, single exosome work? Exome or exosome? Exosome, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, we have. <laughs> um, uh, you know, sort of related to the question that we got as, asked earlier about processes like synapses and stuff, sort of subcellular um, uh, labs or compartments, mitochondria. We've been thinking about those things as well. I think the big challenge is just like when we went to nuclei, it's just such a small amount of RNA that um, it, it becomes very, very hard to get. You, you would need, you know, millions. I think of exosomes to actually get enough, you know, material to sequence. Yeah, but what if it's not RNA? You know, it's just a, 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 a random hexamer for binding any nucleotide that's in there. Uh, we've tried that. The challenge with random hexamers is that you don't get a very stable hybridization. Mm -hmm. So, having 30 Ts is very, very specific right. and strong binding. Can you put an antibody on these beads to do chromatin precipitation? I, it's, I, I think there. I think there's a rich world to do. You know, beads with stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you sort of zoom in on your data to a single cell line, <coughs> how much information do you get about heterogeneity within a cell population? I mean, have you looked at that yet? Like yeah, I mean, again, it depends on how you define a population. So these are, I, there are a huge number of analysis questions, and a lot of which are beyond my mathematical expertise. 
uh, capabilities. But um, I give you an example. Um, uh, we can see evidence of endogenous activation of subpopulations of neurons because there are certain genes like FOS and all these other genes that are upregulated <coughs> cells are uh, firing. And so you can see, like on our clustering plots, they, they kind of form an edge of a cluster because they all have a certain expression commonality, but they're similar enough that they don't ever really separate out from the other cells. So that's an example. I don't know if we've, we don't have like a, a good metric for characterizing that in general. But. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for all your questions.